London was a convenient spot on the Thames. Romans invaded in 43 CE, calling it Londinium in the province of Britannia. The Romans marched out when called back to defend Rome in 410, leaving the native Celts and Saxon mercenaries with a partly Romanized culture. Active trade stopped, barter returned, and London was no longer a commercial center. That point could be considered the start of the Middle Ages. Britannia was soon invaded by Anglo-Saxons and the Celts fled, were killed, or assimilated. Silver pennies were minted in London beginning in the 640s, suggesting a rising economy. Craftspeople were exporting wool and cloth by the 8th century. London may have had a population of about 8,000 by then, mainly rural with standard crops, sheep, and other livestock. There were exports, but most activity was local. The wool trade was growing. A London merchant might buy fleece from the Cotswolds, take it by pack horse to London, and then ship the wool to Calais. A chief wool and cloth selling event was the Bartholomew Fair starting on August 24th at Smithfield in central London. Henry I granted a charter for the fair in 1133. The wool fair continued until the mid-19th century. Smithfield also was London's livestock market and continues today. Vikings appeared by 835, sailing up the Thames perhaps mainly to trade. They attacked London in 842. Anglo-Saxon kings were no match for Viking raiders, except Alfred the Great, resulting in splitting England based on the Danelaw. Alfred retook London, and the king refortified the city. Too bad about future king Ethelred the Unready, losing to the Dane king Canute. England became Saxton-led again when Edward the Confessor became King of England in 1042, seemingly promising just about anyone the crown, including William of Normandy. When Edward died in 1066, William invaded and defeated Harold at the Battle of Hastings. William then attacked London, causing considerable carnage. He later built three castles there, including the Tower of London. Kings and lesser lords seemed to be perpetually short of cash and willing to sell benefits. William granted a charter of self-government to the burgesses of London. The merchants could focus on economic riches interrupted by the war for control between King Stephen and Empress Maud. London laid out the welcome mat for first one and then the other when they marched through. Ultimately, Maud's Plantagenet son, Henry II, became king. The Crusades were big news, and Henry's son and successor, Richard the Lionheart, was off to Jerusalem. That took a pile of gold, much of it demanded from London merchants traded for extra rights. Fortunately, London was prosperous exporting wool, tin, lead, and wheat. Feudalism was fading as the economy was increasingly cash-based. Richard's successor, John, was a bad enough king that the barons forced him to sign the Magna Carta in 1215, called it a step towards democracy. During the 13th century, the population of London reached 80 to 100,000 with a warm climate and successful farming across England. The 14th century was filled with crises. First, 
the great famine of 1315 to 17, was caused by cold weather and floods. The Black Death appeared in 1348 and then recurred several times. Despite the chaos, taxes went up, leading to the Peasants' Revolt of 1381 with the killing of London elites. The next century saw new problems, which we'll mention shortly. Bakers used beehive-shaped ovens of stone and later brick. The bread bottom was often black and hard. Rich folk demanded the upper crust. Elites ate the best quality white bread. For peasants, a standard loaf of rough wheat and rye was dark in color. In hard times, beans, peas, acorns, or weed seeds were added to the recipe. Bread was a food necessity. Romans mined British coal mainly to heat baths. After the Romans were gone, coal was first mentioned in 852 and seemed to become important around the 13th century, especially for metallurgy. As forests were cut down, coal replaced wood for fires. The coal was transported by horse cart or by barge and sold in London by the cauldron to lug home for heat, cooking, or metallurgy. Unlike the king, none of the miners was a merry old soul. The basic coin of Britain was the silver penny minted in London. The best silver came from the Hanseatic League, from mines in Germany and Poland, what the English called Easterlings, and the silver became sterling. The Hanseatic League was a confederation of merchant guilds and market towns from Estonia to Holland. Serfs, fleeing from near slavery, could come to London but they had to stay a year to become free, making a living, basically attempting to avoid starvation, was difficult. For most people, it was a subsistence economy. They likely survived from day work and alms from the church. Poor women called regraders were allowed to buy leftover cereal, then ground it up to sell the next day. Not so much. It was almost always home cooking. But visitors like merchants and diplomats needed to eat. Poor travelers often depended on the hospitality of churches. There were cook shops handing out fast food like meats, pies, and cakes. Hygiene was questionable. Taverns offered ale, bread, wine, and meats. These could be attached to inns and limited to the guests only. The Christmas season lasted from the Feast of St. Nicholas on December the 6th to Twelfth Night on January 6th. Given long nights and cold temperatures, any reason to celebrate was welcome. Kings and London Lord Mayors could hold large feasts to reduce hostilities. A favorite was Christmas pie with multiple meats, including beef, mutton, goose, and chicken, with beef fat, dried fruits like apricots, currants, and dates, plus spices. A boar's head, hunted, or a domestic pig was a tradition held over from the Romans. To drink wassail, a brew of ale, apples, spices, and honey. Doctors used the ancient world sources like Galen, with bleeding seeming to be the favorite cure. London had apothecaries, the best hope for practical herbal remedies, like anise for stomach ailments, dill as a diuretic and flatulence, and fennel for respiratory infections. Hemlock and opium were also used, hopefully in moderation. Surgeons began as barbers and butchers, treating everything from toothaches to amputations. 
One of the great inventions of the millennium was Gutenberg's printing press in the mid 15th century, perhaps a start date for the modern world. The first printing press in England was set up by William Caxton at Westminster in 1476. The first book published was Chaucer's Canterbury Tales. This was also the beginning of standardizing spelling in English. The War of the Roses led to Henry Tudor defeating Richard III and declaring himself King Henry VII. The Middle Ages ended in England with King Henry VII Tudor's rule or King Henry VIII closing all the monasteries. In any case, it's on to Paris and the rise of the Capetian kings next time on Food, History, and Mystery.